We said that storing passwords, we store the password on the system that we're trying to access, as well as the username or user identity. And when a, a user tries to access the system, a you know, simple picture, they supply their ID and their password. So the submitted values of the ID and password, they are compared against the stored values. So we look up the ID, and then we look up the submitted password compared against the stored password. If they match, the user is authenticated. If they don't match, they, they are not allowed in. We said that we don't want to just store the password on the database because there's a problem if, if this database of ID and password for a system which has many users, if that database is compromised somehow, that is, an attacker can get access to that system and get access to that database, then all the passwords of the, our users are released and that attacker can use that to access the system if we don't reset everything or potentially to access other systems if people reuse passwords across different systems and they do. Okay, so we don't want to store the password in the clear so we need to hide the password but still be able to check that the password supplied is the correct one. We said that we could encrypt the password and that works, it hides the password but there's a bit of a problem there in that when we encrypt the password in the database, when they, the user supplies their password, we need to either decrypt the one in the database or encrypt the supplied one. In both cases, we need a key. And that key needs to be stored somewhere so that we, the software can do it automatically. And if we store that key on the same system where the database is stored, then in a, if an attacker can access this database, they can also access the key and decrypt and learn all the passwords. So we don't gain much there if we store the key on the same system as the database. Turns out we don't have to encrypt, we can use a hash function. And we mentioned that the properties of the hash that we take advantage of here what we do is, in the database for storing the password, we don't store the password, we store a hash of the password. And there are two important properties of hash functions we're relying on. The one-way property, it's hard for an attacker, if they have the hash value, to find the original input, the password. That is, if our database consists of a lot of rows containing user ID and hash of password, if the attacker obtains that database, they just see the hash values. And if we've used a secure hash function, the one-way property says that if they can see the hash values, they cannot easily work back to get the password. That's the idea of the hash function here. So that they, they can see the hash values, but they, can't, they don't know what the passwords are, so they don't know uh, which passwords to use or to supply on other systems. The other point is that how do we check the password? When the user submits their password, they don't submit the hash value, they submit their actual password. Our database stores the hash of the password. What we do to check if they've submitted the correct password is calculate the hash of the submitted one, compare it to the hash of the stored one, and the collision-free property says that if the hashes match, it means that they were the same password. The collision-free property says that two different passwords will produce different hash values. Or, if the passwords submitted and the passwords stored are the same, then the hash values will be the same. So we submit the password, the system calculates the hash of the submitted password, compares against the hash of the stored password. If they match, user is authenticated. If not, they're not allowed in. So that's the common approach with storing passwords, store the hash of the password. We'll go through that a little bit more depth and look at some of the, some of the numbers of what an attacker needs to do to, to find the password, even if the hash of the password is stored. So 
the basic approach is if we store the password in the clear, that is the ID and the password, then the attacker can get access to that password. If we encrypt the password, then we need to do something with the key that was used to encrypt it. We need to usually store it on the system so that we can decrypt, but then the attacker may find that. So the common approach, the first approach is to store a hash of the password. You store the ID and a hash of the password. So if you have on your system a million users, you have a popular website, there are one million registered users, so you'd have a database with all of their IDs or usernames and the hash of all their passwords. When I say database here, it could be an actual uh, relational database, it could be a, a file or any other storage system. So let's consider this case and, and give some numbers of if that's the way that we store passwords, what does an attacker need to do? How much effort do they need to break that system? and just go through some simple examples. And these examples you have in the handout, if you go to the end of the, the slides on authentication, there's somewhere, page 133, I've written up a, a description of passwords, hashes, and, and what we're going through. So you'll see this data is on page 133 and, and beyond. So it's uh, the PDF is on the website as well. So this is just an example to say if we store the usernames and the passwords where the passwords are in the clear then our database may look something like this. So we have our usernames, we have the passwords that those users chose so when they register with the system the passwords would be stored in the clear. The problem with this, some attacker so this is the database that we'd store in our system. If an attacker can access our system through other means and download this database, they've immediately learned everyone's password. Doesn't matter how uh, insecure that password was or how random it is, the attacker immediately learns some other people's passwords. And that's a big problem for websites because websites, uh, one of their key resources or assets is the list of users. Right, websites often make money from having a large number of users. So if that website is compromised and an attacker obtains the database, then those users are effectively compromised and may, longer, may no longer use that website. Okay, their, their personal data is released. In this example that we'll go through, we'll assume that users choose a, in the, uh, an eight character password. Okay? just for this example. They don't have to in, in general. Another benefit of hashing the password, well no, we'll come back to that. Let's keep going. So we don't want to store it in the clear, we want to, ha to calculate the hash of the password. So here's the same database, the same passwords in fact, but the hash of those passwords stored. Here I think I used MD5 as an example hash function. What I did, when each user registered their password, they choose the password, John chooses my secret, then the system calculates the MD5 hash of my secret and produces this value, 06C2, so on, and the system stores that hash value in the, in the database. And for each of the users, the hash value is stored. Now, in this case, if an attacker gets access to this database, they don't have immediate access to the passwords. They only have access to the hash values. What do you do 
to find the password. If you're the attacker now, you get this database, that is the second table, you want to find the passwords, well there are two basic approaches. You can try and defeat the hash function in the same way that, for example, encryption, we can talk about a brute force attack with encryption, we can try every key. A similar concept with hash functions is that you can try and defeat the one-way property. We say the one-way property is given the hash value you can't go backwards. Well, in theory you can go backwards, but in practice it takes a long time. And the amount of time it takes to defeat the one-way property, to find the input given the output, depends upon the length of the hash in general. And I'm not sure if it's mentioned on the slides, but to defeat a hash function generally takes, if we have the hash value, a brute force on a hash <coughs> function actually on an n-bit hash value requires 2 to the power of n attempts. So to given the hash value, if you want to in general defeat the one-way property, you need to take 2 to the power of n attempts, where n is the length of the hash value, to find the original input. The MD5 hash function which was used in this example uses a 128-bit hash value. So if you know the hash value to get the original password with a brute force attack requires 2 to the, one, two to the power of 128 <coughs> attempts. What do I mean by attempts? Essentially applying the hash function on different values. So one way you can do is just guess a password. Choose a random value, calculate the hash of that, see if it matches this. And we'll see that, that we can do it a little bit more uh, smarter than the brute force in a moment. How long does 2 to the power of 128 hash functions take? About a million. About a million what? Uh, a million seconds, a million days, a million centuries? Well, let's try and put some numbers to it. We'll show some, uh, some different values. Let's say I need to calculate the MD5 hash function 2 to the power of 128 times to do this attack. Then we need to know, if we want to put a time to this, we need to know how fast is a computer to calculate a hash function. Let's have some guesses. How many hash functions do you think my computer can calculate per second? Have a guess. How many hash functions can my computer calculate per second? Just a guess, that's all right. More than a thousand is, is correct. Maybe a bit... Millions, okay, so millions per second. Let's see on a couple of computers, and then we'll talk about some typical values, and then see what that transfers in terms of time. So I'll try on my computer. Uh, actually, not my laptop. I've logged into my desktop in my office. Actually, that was useful. My desktop is quite old now. Uh, three or four years old. It's a, just a standard Intel i5 CPU, three or four years old now, so you can get faster, but let's run a speed test with OpenSSL. 
which you're using for your homework. As a reminder, you have homework to finish this week. MD5 is the hash function we're using in this example, but there are others we'll see. We'll do a speed test. I'll not run to the end. We'll actually stop there, because that's enough value. My computer did, that's what, about 12 million, almost 13 million MD5 hashes in three seconds. It ran it for three seconds. So 12 million in three seconds is 4 million per second. So my desktop can do about 4 million per second MD5 hash functions. Other hash functions maybe have different speeds. SHA-256 slightly slower, about 10 million. So still in the same order of magnitude, millions per second in terms of my laptop, uh, my desktop, my laptop's a bit slower. So here about 4 million per second. <coughs> How long does it take to try 2 to the power of 128 attempts? If our speed is 4 by 10 to the power of 6 hash attempts per second, then we can calculate the time. Two to the power of 128 divided by 4 million <coughs> will give us the time in seconds. Divide by 60 to convert to minutes, convert to hours, and let's even convert to days. So this answer will give us the number of days it takes my computer. Nine, or about 10 to the power of 27 days. Years. It's 10 to the power of 22 centuries, okay? So this is, this brute force attack is not possible on my computer. It takes 10 to the power of 22 centuries to do that, if I just ran it on my computer. But maybe I have access to a thousand computers. Maybe the lab computers and others, I can spend some money. So divide by a thousand, 10 to the power of 19 centuries. So we see like the brute force attacks on keys this is not possible in practice. So the answer of how long? Too long. That is, it's not possible to do such an attack. So that's why we, well that's the reason for hashing the value. But this is a brute force attack. We can be a little, a little bit smarter. Brute force in this case really is try a random input, calculate the hash, compare against the existing one. Just to give you another number on the speed, so my computer is actually quite slow. You can get dedicated hardware. Mine was an Intel CPU. How could I calculate faster? hash functions with some common hardware. What would I do? I want to calculate hash functions faster than using my normal Intel CPU. Change my hardware to what? What other hardware? There's not much better nowadays than an Intel 4 gigahertz CPU. You won't go much faster. Maybe you'll go up to 8 million and save. You get half the time. Overclock. What about some different hardware? Anyone play games? Turns out that graphics cards, GPUs, can calculate hash functions much faster than CPUs in many cases. Graphics cards are, are hardware dedicated to doing graphics type operations 
And some of those operations, uh, there's similarity to how um, hash functions work. So graphics cards can be much faster than general purpose CPUs. And it depends upon the graphics card, the GPU. Here's some data, maybe a little bit old. This is some data, if we just look at maybe PC1 and PC2. PC1 had an AMD graphics card. We'll zoom in in a moment or we'll see the d numbers. And PC2 had an NVIDIA graphics card. And they were used to do the hash calculations. Not the general purpose CPU. And the numbers that they could achieve with PC1, this is 8.5 billion hashes per second. So my computer could do about 4 million. This GPU can do about 2,000 times faster. Okay, 8 billion hashes per second. So with dedicated hardware, you can do much better than a normal or an old, old PC. If it was 8 billion, or let's even round it up to maybe about 10, 10 billion. So 8.5 mega hashes per second. 8,581 8, million hashes per second. Let's say it was not 8,500, but 10,000, to make it a nice round number. 10 to the power of 10 hashes per second, this hardware. Different algorithms have different speeds. And different hardware as well. But let's just record that number. We'll use it later. What if we could do faster than mine and could do it about 10 to the power of 10 times per second? Which is about a thousand times faster than my computer, still a thousand times faster, we saw the numbers was 10 to the power of 19 centuries. It's still too long to do a brute force attack. But we'll use that number shortly with another type of attack. How can we be a little bit smarter in, as an attacker? We want to find the password of John we have his hash value. Let's assume that the, our users were smart when they chose passwords. Let's assume they chose random passwords. All, right. All our users had to have random passwords that were generated for them. Still, we want to find the password. And if, I think if we look up, one of the users, was it Sandy, did choose a random password. This was just a random password. As an attacker, what we can do is since we know that passwords are usually of a short length, we should only try passwords of that particular length. A hash function takes any length input and produces a fixed length output. But when we apply a hash function on a password, it's typical that users use passwords which are small. We know that. So if we know something about the length, we can try passwords of a particular length, calculate the hash of some possible passwords, compare to the value stored. If we match, we've found their password. So let's consider how long does it take if we attack by trying passwords of particular lengths. Rather than just trying random values, like in the brute force attack. So when I say too long here, it's in the order of, what, 10 to the power of, I think, 22 centuries. Or years. It doesn't matter whether it's centuries or years. It's still too long. Let's try something different. Let's assume that uh, we know that the passwords are limited to eight characters. 
We may be the design of the system, we know something about the, the design and that the passwords are up to eight characters in length. No one has larger than eight characters. So as an attacker, there are a limited set of possible passwords. Those passwords which are one character in length, well, shouldn't be many of them, or maybe the system doesn't allow that, but we may consider that. Those passwords which are two characters long, three up until eight characters long. How many are there? Let's assume eight characters. Every password, the user cannot have more than eight characters in their password. Well, let's go backwards. How many passwords would there be if we had... Uh, well, no, let's go forwards. If we have a password length which is one character, how many possible passwords are there? Your password is one character long. How many possible values are there? You get to choose a password. Let's say you can choose randomly. You choose randomly. So how many possible values are there if you have a one character password? I see people calculating. How are you going to calculate this? A to Z, there are 26. 1 to 9. What about 0 to 9? Another 10. 36. What about A to Z uppercase? Passwords could be uppercase or lowercase generally. So that's uh, 62. Uppercase, lowercase plus numbers is 62 characters. Can we use other characters in passwords? Sometimes we can, so it depends upon the system. Often we can. Well, the, the upper set is generally limited by... The upper limit is limited by the number of characters our keyboard handles normally. If you look at a keyboard, how many characters can you create in one language? Let's stick with English. How many characters could we create on a keyboard? Well, there's... Yes, the 62 numbers and letters, plus there's all the punctuation characters. Hash, comma, exclamation mark and so on. And there's about 32 of them. Look on your keyboard and count the, the normal punctuation characters. And there's about 32 of those. So often we say that the number of printable characters on a keyboard are 94. If you think the numbers all have a character above them, right, so of those 32, every number has a special character above it when you press shift the number, so there's another 10. If I look at my keyboard, I don't have a picture, there's another other set of characters like the brackets, uh, comma, apostrophe, uh, double quotes, and so on. I've counted them, as have others, and it's about 94. And we'll assume that for this case. Different keyboards may have different <coughs> limits. So, if you get to choose a password which is one character long, let's say that there are 94 possible values. What if you're allowed to choose two characters? And you choose them randomly. How many possible passwords can we create with two characters? characters. The first character could be one of 94, the second character could be one of 94, so we have 94 squared. Three characters, 94 to the power of three. All right, we can repeat the characters if we like. So in general we can see in this example 94 to the power of x, where x is the number of characters.
If I'm allowed up to eight characters, or exactly eight characters, there are 94 to the power of eight possible passwords. So what an attacker needs to do, because the passwords which were chosen are out of this set, they're either one, two, three, or up to eight characters long, what they need to do as an attack is to choose a possible password, calculate the hash of it, compare the calculated value against the stored value. If they match, we've found the password. That is, what they do is the attacker knows the hash value. Let's say they know the hash value of Sandy's password is 5FC2 and so on. That's the value that's known. So what they do is, in this attack is choose possible password P1. Maybe it's a one character password. A. Calculate the hash of P1. And compare it to the hash value say the this value that's the one we're trying to find or break does it equal H if it equals if the hash of P1 equals H then it means the password Sandy chose is P1 if not then they try another password. Compare it. Does it equal Sandy's hash? If not, move on. Find the next password, maybe the next, the letter C, for example. Move on. Calculate the hash. Compare. If it's not equal, then move on. And once we've done the one character passwords, try the two character passwords. There's only 94 of the first one. Move on to the two character passwords. Keep going. And assuming that the password is eight characters or less, then in the worst case, the attacker needs to try all of these possible values. One of them is the password. One of them will produce a hash that matches. So they keep going, trying them all, and then they try, let's say, PM. And they find the hash of PM. They compare it to Sandy's hash. Does it match? Yes. Now they've found the password of our user, Sandy. So this is slightly different than the brute force attack where you just try any length values. Here we know that the password is of limited length, so we just try pass, and we know the password is made up of just printable characters, so we only have to try that smaller set of values. How many possible values in the worst case do we need to try? Worst case, we need to try them all, which is what? 94 to the power of 8. Just add up those numbers there. Let's do that. If you had four characters, that's 78 million, 94 to the power of 5, 94 to the power of 6, plus 
up to seven characters is about six by ten to the power of thirteen. Ten to the power of nine is a, a billion, so this is sixty thousand billion possible values. If we add in ninety-four to the power of eight, so with up to seven, from one up until seven, it's about ten to the power of thirteen. With up to eight, it's about ten to the power of fifteen. So, of course, the most significant contributor there is the, the eight character passwords. So we have six by ten to the power of fifteen possible passwords. And in fact, it's not much different what is 10 to the 94 to the power of 8. 6 by 10 to the power of 15. 94 to the power of 8 is also about 6 by 10 to the power of 15. So the rest, the, the 7 character passwords and so on, only add on a little bit more. If we need to do all the 8 character passwords, then that's the major uh, proportion. So this number approximates to about, it's a little bit more than 94 to the power of 8. So it's in fact that longest length password that takes the most time. So sometimes for simplicity we'll say that, well, this number is about the same as 94 to the power of 8. Because that's so, small, so large, the others are relatively small. How long does it take? So what we do is we have to, for all of those values, so 6 by 10 to the power of 15 values, calculate the hashes and compare. And calculating the hash is the slow operation. Comparing the value is very, very fast. So we don't count that in terms of time. How fast can we calculate hash values? We're assuming we've got that GPU, that graphics card, and we can do about 10 to the power of 10 per second. So roughly we have six by 10 to the power of 15 divided by 10 to the power of 10. That gives us the number of seconds <coughs> divided by 60, divided by 60 again, that gives us hours. That gives us the number of days. So now with our reasonably cheap graphics card, maybe 10,000, 20,000 baht, it takes about seven days. Where'd that come from? About seven days. That is a reasonable time for the attacker. All right, so what they do is that they leave their hardware running for a week and eventually they find a Sandy's password by trying those one, two, three, up to eight character passwords. They'll eventually get the correct password. And in fact, in those seven days, they, just won't, they won't just find Sandy's password, they'll find the hash values for all the other users at the same time because they are also in that same set. So, although a brute force attack on a hash because of the one-way property in general is not possible, 
Because we know the password, the input to the hash function is small, we can just try all possible uh, passwords and after a week find the correct password. So the hash hasn't helped much in this case. How do we prevent such an attack? How do we make it harder for the attacker? Hash twice? If you hash multiple times, then they need to do two hashes. Sometimes hash functions don't work like that, that two is no better than one, but if, if it does, then yes, if you hash twice, you slow things down, it's now 14 days. They have to wait two weeks instead of one week. Maybe the attacker is willing to wait for one for two weeks. Okay. What else could you do? So yes, change the, the way that you hash. Use the same algorithm two times or use a different algorithm. Some algorithms are faster than others. And, and in this case we want a slow algorithm. MD5 is fast to calculate. That makes it easy for the attacker. We want a slow algorithm such that if the attacker tries this, it takes them a long time. So here we care about the speed of the algorithm, the hash algorithm. We'd like, from a security perspective, a slow algorithm. If you look at these results, MD5 for this PC got 8.5 billion. SHA-1 only 3 billion, so that's a factor of 3 times slower. SHA-512 less than half a billion, so that's much much slower, meaning from 8.5 billion down to half a billion, then what's that? That's almost 20 times slower so instead of taking one week, it would take 20 weeks if we use the SHA-512 algorithm. So using a different algorithm can help. And there are some algorithms better than others recommended for, for hashing passwords. What else can we do? If we require the user to use a nine character password, they must use nine characters. They cannot use eight or less they must use a nine character password then with a nine character password how many possible values? 94 to the power of nine so instead of taking seven days we'd need to try 94 times as many passwords if we try eight characters we'd need 94 to the power of eight attempts if it was nine characters it's 95 times as many as that so it would take 94 times as long about a hundred times seven is about two years. Okay, seven hundred days is about two years. So adding one more character to the password and making people use that nine character password, assuming it's random, will make this attack grow out to two years rather than one week. And that can be effective. The attacker doesn't wait, want to wait for two years to find someone's password, they've probably changed it since then. Any questions on breaking hashes of passwords? The numbers are given in the printed handout, so you can keep track of them there. What it makes clear is that it's possible for the attacker to find the password if we use, say, a small password if you use a particular hash algorithm, MD5 in this case is quite fast for the attacker to calculate. So we need to carefully design the password selection strategy for the users and the storage so that such an attack is not possible. Even worse, there are ways to speed it up even further for the attacker. What the attacker does Instead of calculating all of these over seven days, they go to a website. They go to a website and they download a database, or they pay for someone to deliver via a hard disk, a database with all the hash values already calculated. 
Here's an example. Here is a database. It contains all the ASCII characters from length 1 to 8. That's what we looked at. One character up to 8 character passwords. The ASCII characters, 32 to 95, so that covers the, the printable characters. It's, in this case, 6 by 10 to the power of 15 values. That's what we said, 6 by 10 to the power of 15 values stored. So you can buy this database, and this database contains a list of hash values and the corresponding passwords. So instead of you as the attacker having to calculate all of them yourself over seven days, you buy this and then you just do a lookup. You know the hash value, Sandy's hash value, you compare it to the table that you've got in this database and you find the password immediately. Looking up a table is very fast, okay? much, much faster than calculating a hash. So instead of taking seven days, people report numbers, it takes less than an hour to find the, the password from such a database. These databases, the basic approach <coughs> is that we store we store all the values of the passwords, we don't need to draw it again, the database stores the password and the hash of the password for every possible password value, the 94 to the power of 8 or 6 by 10 to the power of 15 values. And then when you have that database, you look up, you know the hash value, you compare it to this column, find the match, and then you found the password. And that can be very, very fast. How big? That is, to store all of those passwords and the hash values. How big is a password? Let's say 8 character password. An 8 character password is 8 bytes. We'll ignore the, the shorter ones. The password is 8 bytes. And we have also the hash value. With MD5, the hash value is 128 bits. That's the hash. And we need to store 94 to the power of 8 values. So we store that many values of password and hash. How big is that? this database, 128 bits divided by 8 is 16 bytes, the hash value is 16 bytes of storage, the password is 8, 24 bytes of storage times by 94 to the power of 8. That's how many values we need to store, approximately. That's how many bytes convert to megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes. This database of all these passwords and hash values is about 146,000 hard disks, terabytes. Let's say you have a one terabyte hard disk, you need to buy 146,000 of them to store all of these passwords. Not possible. Who's going to do that? Where are you going to put all the hard disks? So the size of storing all these values is not possible. But what people have designed is they've designed some data structures to store them in a much more efficient manner, essentially compressing that data. So instead of having to store 146 terabytes,
If we stored 146 terabytes, we can do a lookup in maybe hours, not seven days. But since that's too large, people have designed data structures. And this 146 terabytes is reduced down to about 500 gigabytes. Two different formats, 576 gigabytes, or even down to 460 gigabytes. And the data structure is called a rainbow table. A rainbow table is designed specifically for storing these values in an in a optimized form. And it essentially compresses it down to about half a terabyte. And that's manageable. So what you do, you either download this table, or you pay for a disk to be sent to you, and then you can do lookups. The data structure is called a rainbow table. And you can get, get that down to about half a terabyte. <coughs> that's manageable. And that's what's done in practice. A lookup on a half a terabyte ta rainbow table takes hours. Not hours factorial, but hours. The password attack would take us seven days if we tried it. But the faster way for the attacker is to, if once they have this database, this rainbow table of about half a terabyte, they just look up the value in this table, and the lookup may take in the order of hours. Depends on what value, you find, where it is in the, in the set. So that's much easier for the attacker. So our use of hash values of storing passwords is still not so secure. If our passwords are eight characters or less, then you can go and quite easily, as the attacker, get this rainbow table. And you only need one of them, because everyone's password is in that set. And you can break everyone's password in the matter of hours. So that's not secure. So the next step to try to make it more secure, the storage of passwords, is not just to store the hash of the password, but when the user creates a password, add a random value to it. So if a user has an eight character password, add some random characters to it, effectively increasing the length and store that, and that makes it practically impossible for such ram rainbow tables to be used. And this extra value we add to the password is called the salt. Let's see. Coming back to our lecture slides. Hashing passwords is not enough. Because of the use of these stored tables, which you can easily get access to as an attacker, it's possible if the attacker does get the database for them to quite easily find the passwords. So we don't gain much in terms of security. So the recommended way to store passwords is slightly different. Where is it? Here. We have a new value added called a salt. It's just a random number. And we calculate the hash of the password combined with the salt. So what happens with storage is that when you register your username and password, you select, say, you have a random password or the password selected. The system generates a random salt value, an s-bit value, stores that in the database, in the clear, and when it hashes your password, it actually combines your password p with the salt, concatenates them, maybe takes your password, adds the salt at the end, and hashes that value together, and that is stored.
let's say an example. This is the example extending from our set of users from before. This is the recommended way to store passwords. So each username is stored in the database, the user ID. When a user registers, the user chooses a password, but the system, the software, generates a random salt value. So here I've generated a, a five character random uh, salt value. It's essentially an S-bit value. And the hash value stored is a hash of the salt combined with the password. And that's stored. So the three values are stored. The salt is public. That is, it's stored in the database. It's not encrypted. It's just a random number. Now, what the attacker needs to do, if they learn this database, let's say the attacker now again wants to find Sandy's password. What do they do? They know the password is eight characters or less. So to find Sandy's password, same as before, they try password one, they calculate the hash of password one combined with the salt and they know the salt value. So we don't gain much of security in this type of attack because the attacker knows the salt value. They know the value U9, whatever it is. And then they calculate the hash of this possible password, P1, and compare it to the actual hash value, H. If it doesn't match, they try another password, same as we did before. P2, the hash of P2 combined with the salt, it's the same value. And they compare it to the <coughs> stored hash value and they keep tr trying. And eventually they'll get the correct password. <coughs> the hash of the password that they try with the salt These characters here, just think they're random characters. Compare it to the hash value H. If it matches, then we've found the password. Same as before, from the attacker's perspective, except we also must include the salt in the hash value. How long does this take? Using our numbers from before, how long did it take to try in the worst case time? Someone wrote down the number. How long did it take to try, in the worst case, uh, 94 to the power of 8? How many days? It took us seven days when we did this before. It's exactly the same number of operations. The only difference is that when we hash the one character password, like the letter A, we combine it with the salt value. When we, then we try B. Then we move on to the two-letter characters, the three letter, uh, two-letter passwords, three-letter, and so on. Worst case, we go through all the eight-character passwords, and we eventually get to the correct password. It still takes us seven days. Nothing has changed here. So the attacker can still break and find the password in seven days. But they cannot use the rainbow table. And that's where the salt has its value. We don't gain security in that perspective, but a rainbow table that we used before stored passwords and hashes of those passwords. And we saw that one of them was about half a terabyte. 
that's, that's manageable. And if we could find the password in the rainbow table, it takes hours. Right? So the attack is not seven days, but hours. Now that we have a salt value, to do an attack using the rainbow table, what the attacker would need to do is have a rainbow table for that particular salt. They'd need to have a rainbow table and that would have the password and the hash of that password combined with a particular salt value U9 this random value that the user had and that would take half a terabyte if they had such a table they could still defeat the hash and find the password in the matter of hours only needs half a terabyte of storage the problem with this approach from the attacker is they don't know the salt value in advance so Sandy's salt was this random character if they wanted to break someone else's password they would need a rainbow table with a different salt value calculated note that the users have random salt values that included Daniel's was different mine is different so from the attackers perspective if they want to look up in the rainbow table they need one rainbow table for each salt value they need a second table which contain the same set of passwords hashed with another salt value taking up half a terabyte and with a let's say s bit salt the salt is s bits long if s is say 16 bits how many possible salts are there if our salt the random value attached is 16 bits long there are two to the power of 16 possible values for an attacker to be able to attack any password using any salt they would need to download or buy disks they would need to buy two to the power of 16 disks each of half a terabyte in length. <coughs> 2 to the power of 16, 32,000. So they need about 16 what's above terabytes? Petabytes of storage. About 16,000 terabytes of storage if they want to use a rainbow table to break the passwords because the passwords may have any salt value. We don't know in advance. So we need to have one for each possible salt value but that requires a very large amount of storage. If we increase the salt length up to say 32 bits, 4 billion hard disks. So what we do by introducing the salt is make the rainbow table attack impractical. With the rainbow table the attacker can download one database in about half a terabyte and find the passwords in a matter of hours but if we introduce a salt then the attacker needs a rainbow table for every salt value so they need to download a rainbow table for every possible salt value and that requires too much space to store depending on the salt length let's say a small salt of 16 bits leads a, about 16 petabytes of storage necessary which again is too costly or not possible so the recommended way to store passwords you store the ID the system generates a random salt value for the user and when that password is stored initially the hash of the password combined with the salt is stored that prevents rainbow table attacks it doesn't prevent attacks that took us seven days of trying all passwords to prevent that make sure either you have different hash algorithms or longer passwords but it does prevent lookup type attacks using rainbow tables
it's hard to see the advantages or, or I think we've gone through a lot of details and many people may not see the benefits of the rainbow tables but make sure you can look at up until that point and see how we store passwords and remember solding passwords is necessary One minor benefit of assault also Do any of these users have the same password? John, Sandy, Daniel or Steve? If you can see those hash values, do they have the same password? Well you can't know because you see the hash values, they're all different How do we know? We can't see directly whether they have the same password But in fact, they did If we go back to the original passwords John and Daniel did have the same password If we don't use the salt value, the hash values will become the same By adding a random value to it, because they'll both get different random values their hash values become different So that's a minor benefit of using the salt as well You get different hash values even if you have the same password We're not going to look at how rainbow tables work, but you should be aware that at least you store a salt, a random value. The password is concatenated with that salt, combined together, and calculate the hash of them combined. You store three values. To finish today, let's show an example bring up an example that you can have a real storage of passwords on Linux operating systems, where's the password information stored? Some of you have seen this in my lab. Where do I find the password information about the users on my computer? What's the file? It's into the ETC directory. Not interfaces. Not services. There's another one or two files that we've mentioned in, in a in a lab, those that have taken it. There's an etc slash passwd file. This file stores usernames. So we see some usernames. But the passwords are not actually stored in this file, it refers to another file. called the shadow file and we don't have permission to look at that so that's one protection this is the database the shadow is the database on my operating system now we don't want anyone to access that database so we use some permissions to ensure that it's it's hard but let's say there is a weakness in my system such that an unintended user can access well the weakness I know the password or I'll switch to the root user The root user can see that. And we see, and I'll just, so the password information for the set of users, the root user, and others. Let's just look at those three. So here we have three users on my system. 
looks hard to read, but let's highlight one line. The line is separated into different fields. The first field is the username. Here's the username. Then this long field is contains three things. If you will look carefully, there's some dollar signs in there, and that separates this long field into subfields. So there's the username or the user ID. Here's the user ID. This number six tells us what hash algorithm is used. In our examples we said MD5, but there are other hash algorithms. Number 6 refers to SHA-512. So SHA is a hash algorithm and it produces a 512-bit output. The next value between the dollar signs, it's hard to see because they're random characters, but those characters are the salt. So these are random characters generated by the operating system when you set up the account. This value is generated and stored. This is the salt. And the last long set of characters from here up until here is the hash of the password of our user combined with the salt value. Right, so this is the hash value. It's stored in a form that we can print on the screen, but it actually is a 512-bit value. SHA-512 produces a 512-bit output. So our shadow file stores the username, the algorithm, the hash algorithm, using a, a, a number to identify it, the salt, and a hash of the password combined with the salt. As the attacker, what they need to do Here's the hash value, go and find our user's password. They know the salt value, they know the algorithm, they need to defeat, well they need to, the best way is to try and guess passwords. Here, the password may not be limited by eight characters. If the user was smart, he would have chosen a longer password. So if you try and try all the passwords, and if the user chose ten character password, and random, then they, you'd need to do an attack that requires 94 to the power of 10, which would take, in the order of, if it was MD5, it would take uh, something like a 200 years, with fi SHA-512 even longer. So, using the SALT is, is to defend, defend against rainbow attacks. The hash makes it hard to go back to the original password. Of course, unfortunately, users don't choose random passwords. So if a user chooses a password from a dictionary or something that has some structure, then the attack is easier. The attacker just needs to try those possible passwords. Not all combinations of eight characters, but just words from a dictionary. That depends upon the, the structure of the passwords chosen. So we'll stop there. That's an example of the password database stored. If you forget everything from today, then remember just one thing, how to store the recommended way for storing passwords. Store a salt, a random salt, and a hash of the password combined with the salt. <coughs>